Jack Jiggins is a serial property entrepreneur, co-founder of XP Property, currently delivering over 30 million pounds of property each year, as well as owning multiple other property businesses. Jack is the definition of high output and high performance. And in this podcast, we sit down to better understand his business, how he finds his deals, how he funds his deals, and all of the systems he uses that have allowed him to scale so quickly. So I'm a natural deal finder and I love creating deals and best way I think a deal is struck is one of two things, understanding the motives of the seller, and then two, creating the deal. I just knew that the more active I was, the quicker I'd learn. You know, I did, you know, we discussed earlier that at some points I doubted whether we should be doing on market deals. Currently speaking, we've got four sites that we're delivering, and we've got four sites that we've exchanged on and working on planning. If all four of those sites had 10% down, we'd be able to do a fifth of the amount of deals. So. Jack, you guys do one transaction on average, is it every five weeks? Four weeks now, yeah. Going back how long? Uh, just under five years. It was um, seven weeks um, in developments and HMOs. Uh, and then since we have ramped up the social portfolio, it's jumped up to four, every four weeks on average. So how do you do it? Um, work a lot of hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the, so I'm a natural deal finder and I love creating deals and the best way I think a deal is struck is one of two things, understanding the motives of the seller mm-hmm. and then two, creating the deal. Um, a mentor once said to me that he's never got into his office and someone's put a nice red ribbon bow around the deal and it's on his desk. Even if that happens, it's, it, you need to do some work on it oh, very true. somewhere around it, whether it be structuring it agreeing the sale um, or funding it or, or even delivering it. So f- for, for me, I've always been at the front end and I just, I'm a massive advocate because I'm not really that smart. Um, I just knew that the more active I was, the quicker I'd learn. So we've also um, got out 567 hard offers since we set up the businesses. Um, so in terms of like a success rate, it's not actually that good, um, which took a lot of work. And I sometimes look back at the stacks. So sometimes I'll see a site that we missed out on mm-hmm. for my own peace of mind and understanding and progress. I'll, I'll follow that site. So I'll make a tab on it, yeah. ask, find out what the builder built it out for, find out what the GDVs they achieved, and then cross-reference that with what I reviewed it. Some sites that take three or four years to do that, that are not our sites. I look back at my stack and I'm like, oh, my God, this was dreadful. Uh, yeah, um, but I mean, it, it, to, to some degree, that's just because we've, you know, every detailed review you do, you get better and better and more improved. Um, for me, because I am, I'm quite a quick learner, but I don't like reading stuff too much. So I learn off others mm-hmm. um, and activity was a really key and part of that. So for me, d- narrowing down a process and understand it, because the more no's you get, the quicker you're going to be at getting yeses. Um, and we don't have the same success rate now as we did then. So our success rate back then was probably like 2 to 3% on offers out. Mm-hmm. Now it's up to double digits, and that's quite a strong success rate. Um, you could argue some of that's reputation and being able to deliver. Um, so I focus on activity, um, and I think that just purely came about from being active, understanding what the seller's motives are, and consistently following up and creating that that opportunity yeah I think so like my dad always said to me property is a numbers game at like its conception is a numbers game so in order to get out over 500 hard offers how many deal do you offer on everything or you know how many deals are you looking at to get to that number of offers out like in an average week how many deals will you look at yeah so we're we average about 10 offers um a month um, and that is probably off the basis of looking at 40 to 50 deals. Um, everything, every single thing that's ever gone through our detailed analyzer we've offered on, because I hate not leaving something on the table. Um, so we, we have a really high ratio for something we spend time on to what we offer on, because you never know. Um, and when I said hard offers earlier, we have another methodology called soft offers, which I know a lot of people do in the industry, which is where we leave that door open without necessarily offending someone because we're nowhere near. So for an example, call the agent. So we've worked really hard on this. It's been through our design design team. We've pulled it apart. We've worked on your GDV values. We just can't get anywhere near. 
we're at around sort of three, four, five hundred, whatever it is, and then you sort of express that you're still interested in it if, if anything changes. But, that but move on. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, most stuff we offered on, but we probably viewed yeah in excess of a thousand sites since starting. Yeah. Going back to the um, first part of the deal finding process, and you find most of your deals through agents, yeah. which is interesting mm-hmm. because you hear people, including mm-hmm. us, sometimes talk about off-market deals is where you find the best deals. Some people even say you just can't find good deals mm-hmm. through agents. Obviously, you're a testament to the fact that you can, mm-hmm. and obviously most of yours come through agents. How, when you say you're looking at 40, 50 deals a month, I mean, how are those deals coming across your desk? How are you finding them? What's kind of the... So to start off, it was completely proactive, so I didn't have anything coming in because I, I left a sales role in an office and I was in sales so I went from doing nothing to being a labourer on site to then starting developments and I had to try and build that network and it took a while um took lots of meetings um like sometimes I'd go and view something just because I wanted to speak with that individual at the particular commercial agency surveying practice or resi agency um and I'd I you know, I did, uh, you know, we discussed earlier that at some points I doubted whether we should be doing on market deals. But in short, so my background and what, what I used to do when I was a lot younger um, was sell stuff on eBay. And the way I'd sell stuff on eBay is I'd go to page six or seven on Google, find a product that is high ticket item, so it's worth my time to spend on it. Um, I would essentially make sure they've got enough stock, call them and ask to agree a trade discount. So I'll use a prime example. You know the geodesic domes that you have outside pubs and it went, they went crazy over COVID? The geodesic sort of like plastic domes that people had outside of... No? Do you know what that is? No. <laughs> it's basically like a, like a little shell that five, five to ten people can sit outside oh, and have right. a dinner in and it's all lit up, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a prime example. So I found a supplier that was selling those for 800 quid on page six of Google. They were an independent garden company, like B&Q, but a lot smaller. smaller. Um, I then advertised the exact same stock photos on my eBay account. eBay obviously has a higher marketing spend than an independent uh, garden company. Um, and when advertising, I'm now on page one. If you type in garden, d- garden Dome, me as an individual is a, like featured advert on the shopping tab and on the original tab. And I advertise for 1400 1500 quid. When someone makes an order, I just order it off the same supplier for page six and sell it on to the first person now the concept of that is that sounds way too easy to to make money and also to create a deal but that there are agents out there that are the the page six google listers that don't really know how to get in front of the right people that don't know how to arbitrage the value don't know how to value a site and so i like resi agents that are selling commercial i like commercial agents that are selling resi um i like distressed sellers so relaying that to whoever you're buying through. I think one really key thing um, that I install in all of our staff and I've really sort of held as Bible since starting out is if you can't summarise what you need or who you are or what you do really efficiently, how is someone else going to remember that? So I always made it really clear to everyone I was dealing with what I'm looking for and just quickly discounted stuff that was irrelevant, um, which helps the deal flow improve because if they're constantly you're constantly easily remembered and what what you would consider. So I'd say anything between X and X value, there's, there shouldn't really be any reason why they're not sending you anything. And you say it enough times, as soon as the agent's going to come across that, you're the first person exactly. I think of. And then consistency, following up with them, be like, I saw this come on. You forgot about me, buddy. A um, bit of tongue in cheek and they go, oh, yeah, sorry, and then they wait next time. Um, so, yeah, consistency. I think agents, the thing I love about on-market deals um, and you alluded to a transaction earlier that you're going through. Mm-hmm. I, it's not my job to convince someone to sell something. My job is to transact on something once they've been through the mindset of selling it. You can wait two years to transact on that deal. Our business ambition, um, because we were a young, hungry, enterprising company of professionals from property backgrounds, and we knew, we knew, we knew, we knew the property part, we wanted to build the business part, we... We need to be doing quicker transactions to pet to feed the to feed the machine, which is our staff. You know, across the ecosystem of businesses, we're now twenty seven members of staff. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have been able to do that with land deals because we're five years into those businesses being set up. Yeah. We might have waited seven years for the first deal to be pay, paying out. 
Um, so we wanted to build a business. That's our goals. And other people have different things. Some people that have been through corporate lives might want to focus on strategic land, off-market land, work the planning play, because they've already got an income. They've already got uh, a pension. But for us, you know, this is our core business and this was going to be our career. So that's why we love on-site stuff. And I doubt you could probably do on a shoestring budget or a growth strategy budget of reinvestment to do that many deals off market because they take a lot of time and a lot of cash flow to, to, to push those forward. Yeah, and the deals you get, because a lot one thing a lot of people struggle with with on market deals is making them stack because sometimes you get an agent that over inflates, either they don't understand how to value land or they just go with what the landowner wants and there's no basis for that price perhaps. Do you find that most of the deals you get, because you have you know, the in-house architecture and things like that, you're looking at them from the angle of adding value to make it work, or do you make them work exactly as they are when offered to you, if that makes sense? Yeah, so I alluded to like the creation of, of the deal. We've bought, I've bought, a de- I've bought a house that fell through legals three times and they took a hit on the price. I've bought a house where there were hoarders and embarrassed to list it, so I got a discount on the price. I've bought... A building where they didn't measure the basement in the survey and I knew that we could get planning in the basement so there's 30% of value on its existing value that we're getting as a discount. Yeah. I've bought stuff that has been pulled from market because of COVID um, where we've seen something that someone else hasn't. Um, we really like sites that fall in between an investment purchase and a development purchase um, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of people out there that don't have the time or won't have the time, big pension companies or independent buyers that are buying stuff for yield and they don't want headache, maintenance, even development. Yeah. And then you have people who like development um, who want to be building stuff out of the ground and, and, and that is their role. We like stuff in between that's like a really tired investment asset. Um, so that for an example, we bought a block of 14 flats that needed completely rehauling, refurbishment and all of them regearing all the leases increasing all the rents um and that scheme is a 34 percent on gross development value and we haven't extended it um because it falls between the two who's going to buy it and we love that position so our creation has been around anything really distressed selling um structuring of the deal whether it's vendor finance assisted sales um design um mixed use so it sort of falls in a weird patch and we convert some of it um always value we, we would always try and add some value in planning or redesign in any in any way um so as in that block of 14 flats that we bought there was a one bed flat that was um that currently valued at 506 on the price that we paid for the 506k on the price that we paid for the whole block all we did was put a new hallway down the rear of the master bedrooms create two bedrooms and split the bathroom so that it could facilitate the hallway and that's now worth 260 grand for 30 grand worth of work so we're not afraid to redesign as well um, and I think that's just being create creative again. Um, but we try and add value at every stage. That's negotiating, structuring it, funding it, um, whether we can delay the funding, whether we can delay the contract. Um, so we're, we're constantly analysing each step of the way, which is why it works, because Ben and I split our roles in the business. So I work on the acquisitions, the structuring and the funding, and then he works on design, delivery and sales. Um, so we'd like to think that, um, you know, if it was a puzzle, we've thought about every eventuality yeah. possible and a way to up whether it's worth us carrying the site for an extra six months or whether it's not um, to really like investigate the true value. And that's why we're quite dynamic and hungry to add that value, because that's really where, where we make decent margins. What, what are some examples of, I mean... Adding value in the negotiation, of course, that's just maybe being a bit of a, a strong negotiator to get a good price. But you mentioned around delaying the funding, delaying the contract. I mean, that's obviously the more creative side of things. What are some examples of obviously doing that to add value? Yeah, so we, um, a site I mentioned to you before, actually, in North London, um, the seller is selling um, uh, to HMOs that are basically semi-deta- semi-detached HMOs. Um, they're massive, they're like 10 beds each, they're huge, great location, quite an affluent area, flats, exec homes, all HMOs would all do well there. It's pretty tired, he's held them for over over a decade, uh, wants to exit, but wants to deal with buyers that can be flexible on the purchase because of a capital gain um, benefit in, t- in terms of timing. So we understood that requirement. Wait, so just explain that again, so he's the, what's the, what is the issue with the capital gain on his side so evidently the the vendor has exited from assets already in that tax year for himself 
Um, and from a viability perspective, it would be more tax effective for him to change the date, well, to basically not exit from all of his portfolio in one go uh, and take the income from the HMOs and then consider it in, a, in another tax year. Um, so we've, we've said, cool, you know, we're, we're here to buy the assets. And in actual fact, that works better for us. We wanted to submit a planning application for nine units and two executive homes, run the application, hopefully get consent for both. And by the time the sort of site comes to delivery, we'd decide which one we want to inscale and deliver. Um, the way that we structured that creatively is not only have we got a delayed completion, so we agreed 14 months between exchange and completion. So that gives us 14 months to work on building a team around it, getting the consent for the two schemes, um, doing trial pit, like doing everything you need to get ready on a site. We also agreed a 2% exchange fee, um, which, because it's we're buying for an excess of 2 million, the, stamp, the, um, the exchange amount is pretty lumpy. Normally, a standard transaction is 10%, so we didn't want 250K sat in there doing nothing for a year. Um, so we agreed that for that to be... We've um, made that mistake yeah. before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, um, we... I mean, the way that we always argue that is what's the point in sitting in a solicitor's account? We'd rather speed this process up. Um, so we agreed a, a lower exchange amount. Uh, we actually... Um, also agreed to run run and do everything we needed to between now and then. Um, and fundamentally, that flexibility on that transaction gave us 14 months to work on it, a nominal amount down. We've obviously got work on the planning, but we would have, for an example, if, if it had to be an unconditional purchase, we would have been carrying that site through planning and it might have just worked out better to refurbish the HMOs and hold them. Um, if we manage to agree a bit of a delay completion, at least it's just less of an exchange fund down. Now we have, currently speaking, we've got four sites that we're delivering and we've got four sites that we've exchanged on and working on planning. If all four of those sites had 10% down, we'd be able to do a fifth of the amount of deals. So for us, it's, it's creatively understanding what needs to happen, not necessarily just taking standards, pushing back on if it is 10%, why is it 10%? Because the agent's saying so or because the vendor actually wants that. Um, and when you start asking, you start getting. Um, and uh, the, the, the third and final thing we always do with all our contracts, if we can, um, is make the contract assignable. So we've taken a position on site, we've exchanged, we've secured it, we're legally obliged to buy that in that SPV. Uh, but we can assign the contract to someone else if we want to sell it and we're planning or uh, you know trade it into a, an equity joint venture with someone else or whatever that may be. Um, so that's an example of like the structuring from the outset to make it a bit more flexible. So, so the one in North London, it's not obviously it's not an option agreement. It's a, a pretty normal, it's a normal purchase contract. Exactly, yeah. But the risk, if you didn't get the planning you wanted, would you have still completed on it, or you just assign the contract? That particular one, we would, yeah. So we've got a risk valuation for more than what we're paying for it, um, which is dated. So you could argue there's been a bit of value creation and capital appreciation. Um, Normally, we do a conditional contract subject to um, satisfactory consent, which is a very obligatory term because it's what is satisfactory, but that's why we like it. Um, and we normally, even if we fail planning, we still want to try and come to an agreement with the seller. So we normally put satisfactory planning, but we'd like to either renegotiate or, re or readjust where we are to suit planning and supply and demand and what we can deliver and where it's at. That's pretty strong negotiating to get people to agree to... That exchange deposit and then a conditional contract. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing I was going to say. So obviously the ten percent is like pretty standard yeah, solicitors. Sure. Whoever initiates that. It's just assumed, isn't it? It's assumed. What's your and a lot of landowners would be advised ten percent. So mm. then they want it, even though it's not theirs. How do you sort of objection handle that? Because a lot of people would just say, "Oh, you're not good for the money," or "You're not committed." Like, how do you objection handle that to get down from ten percent to two percent on exchange? Um, so so that, that's an example, but we've actually, we've got a, we've got two, um, 2.5 million GDV schemes, which we're in planning and both of those were 5k exchange. So it doesn't have to be 2%, it could be less. Um, but our argument is always that money literally just sits in a solicitor's account and doesn't earn any interest for anyone, doesn't do anyone any benefit, it sits in a client account and does nothing. Our argument is, look, can you su support us in this? We want to make this as seamless as possible and put those funds into yeah. working on the planning or working on the legal process. But there's actually no benefit in it going into the, 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 the solicitor's holding account. Yeah. 
Um, but it's for us, it's a bit more like if we can negotiate that, why wouldn't we? Yeah. We sometimes get pushback. We've had pushback on HMOs or houses or single units because that's just you know yeah. vanilla sale. They're not really used to that. But then again, they're not massive transactions anyway. Yeah. Um, and we we're, we're probably not trying to pull the scheme about between the exchange completion date anyhow. Yeah. Um, so it's just asking the question and saying, you know, it would really help us if we could reduce this down because, th you know, that, so for an example, that scheme, that 160K could be put to much better use, yeah. improving the value of the asset, doing what we need to do, what, you know, working capital in our business. Um, and most people don't really have an issue with it. I suppose if you're, it's a bit like how we would say we don't, we wouldn't pay anything like an option fee mm -hmm. because we say we're putting them we're investing that money into yeah. the planning and if you didn't go ahead and buy that you've still spent the money on the planning exactly, and they, yeah. they've still got the planning on their yeah, piece yeah. of land so they've still come out better i guess yes, in that your commitment is the cost that you're incurring which and again, the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah which makes sense i suppose one thing i always say to vendors that are really concerned about oh but what if it's a low amount and you're going on the planning i'm like look i make a profit when we buy the site we have to buy this site to make a profit. Uh, I haven't run a business for this long by pulling out of transactions, I can reassure you that. So if I can get this done, I will, and I'm happy to be nimble on the exit and what we do with it, but we, you need to work with us. Sure. Um, I know we spent a lot of time on the finding deal side of things, but final thing I'll, I'll be keen to find, about, find out about is, you mentioned, let's say, look at 40 to 50 deals in a month. What's then the decision? get my words out today <laughs> the decision making process around progressing that to the next stage you mentioned you've got a detailed yeah. deal analyzer but is there a, a step in between yes uh, i'm like mr process which is great because it, that means i can out you know offload it or um mm. put it onto our team whether i'm away or busy or or you know doing things like these um do you want the whole process it's pretty detailed. Yeah, let's go yeah. for it. Um, I know <laughs> so, you like talking about it. So, yeah, so uh, <laughs> so I have um, one thing that I really struggle with from the outset is what deal from right move, from someone emailing me, from someone speaking to me in an event, what deal to look at first. That was my first challenge because I found that I would be looking at stuff at all at the same time and I'd miss something that I really like. So I have a grading system, mm -hmm. uh, which is out of 15, and... I grade the deal on three metrics, uh, what the deal is like. So our business have a very set criteria. We like one to 30 units in the home counties of West London. Um, so I'll grade that on, on, on how that deal sits. So if it's a one bed flat that needs gutting and refurbishing against a 14 unit scheme in the home counties, I'd value the 14 unit scheme a five because it's a much better deal for our business. And I'd rent, rate the one bed flat as a, as a one um, because it's it's we can't grow a business on eight flat refurbishments a year, so that's the first grading. Second grading is how well is it marketed, um, because what I'm gauging here is shall I warrant my time on this 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 proposal? Uh, so that's is it on right move? Is it on estate gazettes? Is it everywhere? So this sort of leading towards your grading of off market on market, on market stuff can be badly marketed, and that's what I'm grading here to see how well it's marketed. And then third is who is your contact that's got the deal? Um, if it's your cousin that's got the one bed flat and they haven't approached anyone yet, that's quite a valuable lead. And that might be worth you spending your time on it. Um, if the 14 unit site is an agent you've never worked with and it's everywhere and every man and their dog can go around and view it and you're going to be competing with a lot of people, that value of time might not be worth it. So I, that's how I grade things. If I've got to review five deals in a day, for an example, so that's like a quick like traffic light like green, red, amber. Um, and then when I go on to analyze something, we were very, you could say, millennial focused or, or, or too regiment with our time. We would always send everything through a draft stack before we go and view it. Because half a day at the office for me is a lot of time when we've got 40 sites on our desk. So I would then put it through our draft stacker, which is really high level, rough acquisition price. Um, and I normally would like, follow that with like a 10% discrepancy either way. You know, maybe we, are, we might be able to overpay for it if we could get it conditional or underpay for it if we could do a, a good negotiation at the beginning. And then I would just cross value standard build costs, standard in pound square foot rates, standard out pound square foot rates, and just see where the deal sits. You can quite quickly then see if something's overpriced 
um, which would then warrant me putting a call into the agent and be like, I would come view this because of the deal. It's 14 units in my location. I think it's a great deal. But I'm just, it's just not matching up for me from a desktop perspective. Can you? Uh, and one thing we would always do is I would always pl- say to my team, make sure you're acting the fool and let them lead. So I would always say, I'm missing something here. I must be. Um, can you show me how, you know, I'm, I'm so out here because the acquisition price the land so I, I, we've been outbid on sites with the land value that and what people have paid is the same as what we would pay on our bill costs so i sometimes let the agent then go through that process of realizing it's overpriced and letting them tell me that so i'll go well, how have you priced how have you got to a land value or how have you got to a value for the building and then they work back off gdv and they go oh, it doesn't yes. really work and i go what about finance what about acquisition costs what about professional fees so if it doesn't work, that's what I do. I check in with the agent and see if there's still uh, light at the end of the tunnel to waste my time to go view it or put it for a detailed stack. Um, so that's like traffic light, draft stack, check in if it's really not working. If it's not working, I will leave a door open. I'll say, look, I like the scheme. I think it's overpriced. I'd rather, because we've got such a strong pipeline, have a chat with you in six months when I don't think this is going to be of sold. If it has sold, I think someone's overpaid for it. Um, and I wish them the best and put a note in my diary to call call back in a few weeks um and if it looks good on a draft stack which is basically rough guide or a bit of a discount on the pride and the pound per square foot values look good and i think there might be a value add um i would then go and view or put it for our detailed stacker if it's uh you know quite evidently a well-worked scheme already or if it's a pd scheme or if it's something that could be quite easily digested from a desktop perspective i'll run it through a detailed stack because that would take me five minutes Whereas driving there and back would take me a lot longer. Um, our detailed stack is about 300 input cell on an Excel, so it's quite comprehensive. So we're now getting into quite a um, yeah comprehensive review, but a lot of it's automated. So when you change one, it's inputting others. Okay, but so but the three. I mean, I guess on the on the construction, are you just breaking down all the construction line items as well, or is that pretty much just kind of one blended price per square foot? So we do. Yeah, we do our. Our build comes to, we have three areas. So we have new build, conversion, and refurbishment, obviously because the VAT rating are different on all. We have a blanket um, base rate, pound square foot rate on all three. We then have fixtures and fittings, abnormals, electric connections, warranties, project management fees, all that go in and in addition to that base cost. And obviously your FF&Es, bathrooms, kitchens, which we have an allocated price, which percentages off the GDV because the, the more expensive the house, the more expensive the kitchen, the bathroom, so your base cost will be not far off. Um, so that also automatically inputs bringing up our all-in pound per square foot rate or pound per square meter rate, whatever you work at. And then we cross-reference that with cost per unit, which is also detailed in our ex- uh, in our Excel. So I find PD schemes really difficult to work in at all-in rates because if you're doing a large block of 30 flats, 25 flats, you can sometimes find yourself um, outpricing yourself on construction with pound square foot rates, mm-hmm. whereas um, on new build, you are, you know, working with, you know, ground up development. So it will be a lot more cookie cutter. Um, but that's all basis before we, we view it. So it is very, you know, I, I suppose we just sort of check in with the spreadsheet to make sure it's worth the next stage. Um, but yeah base rate on pound square foot rate and then additionals on top of that and then you make the offer uh yeah so view or run back to the detailed stack um we have um it might be useful for some listeners we have a spreadsheet lead on every spreadsheet we do and what that does is one person that starts it has to finish it whether they do most of the work or not on it doesn't matter to us one person starts it, one person finishes it because there's people in our business and what we found is stuff was getting half done and then no one was signing it off um, so that person's job is to then second get a second opinion with internally. So quite frequently, if I'm leading on that, I'll get Saul, our ops guy, or Ben to, to review it, whether that be construction, design, purchase, finance, whatever it may be. Um, and then we uh, obviously all agree where we're at. I quite frequently don't check in with Ben from a design perspective. Obviously, his technical background is really useful, but I want to be doing deals without any risk. So I am an offering based on something that I don't need Ben to add value to because Otherwise, I won't be able to sell it to a bank or investment because if there's a lot of hope value in there, 
is really sell really difficult to sell to investor partners or banks. So I may bring Ben in or not, and then we would then yeah get the offer forward with an offer deck, our property CV, uh, which is basically just experience and what we've been doing. We have different locations on. CVs, which we think is really applicable, especially for local agents and local landowners. Oh, um, so you include that in the offer to the yeah. agent? Okay. So we, we offer pretty much everything from the outset. So offer letter, including timeframes, who we are, uh, property CV, sometimes regionally focused, uh, proof of funds, um, and then get that over in an email. And one thing I found interesting that you've talked about before is you, you, you have like an AB offer as well. Yeah. To, uh, is, is one like a decoy to kind of anchor the the actual offer that you want to get or is it pretty much yes yeah, so, so the ab offer is really popular in our business if we don't know whether they're time motivated or money motivated um we find that there's a very direct correlation to they will take less money if they want speed and they will take more money if they've got time um and the ab offer is basically a is unconditional giving them the, the speed and b is subject to planning um, sometimes the A offer looks really low on guide, or but then our subject to planning offer is normally guide or above. Um, so it sort of makes the other one look a bit better and gives them the opportunity to have an open conversation, which we always say to the agent. Um, so our, all our offer letters pretty much, unless they've specifically specified only uncon or only conditional, we'll do an A, B offer. Um, the uncon ones are great when they come in because we've normally factored in quite a healthy discount and also de-risk the site to be like right if we had to buy this fail at planning or fail at the condition that we had in the conditional offer and recirculate the site for another purpose or existing purpose or refurbish it we can get our wipe our hands and, and move away but what we're ingraining is our planning uplift if we do manage to secure it for that level um so for us it's it's a yeah a is unconditional which people normally lean to if they're really keen to get something done and then it makes our conditional offer look a bit better which we prefer because it sort of builds into our pipeline and we don't have to do a deal this month um and then if both of those are a no we also sometimes offer a c offer which is an assisted sale where we uh, offer to joint venture with them and and we do everything uh, and they just sit on the asset with a strike value okay last question for me just on the deal finding process is um one thing again that that struck me when I've heard you talk about it before is how much actually comes in your follow-up process yeah and it's rarely the the first offer the first time round that gets accepted or at least not the majority but the follow-up king yeah yeah <laughs> I, I I love follow-up because it's even more satisfying when you've missed out on something first time round and you win it um we've I'll, I'll, I'll give a case study and then I'll talk about why we do it and our ratios because it's 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 crazy and when one of my first questions I ask to anyone when they're struggling to get deals is, do you follow up? And they say, what do you mean? And I'll be like, do you check in with the person that you've offered on a month ago? And they go, well, yeah. And I'll be like, where's your process? You can't remember everyone that you've spoken to. But one example, a <clears throat> site came on the market, straightforward PD scheme in a commuter belt town in Buckinghamshire, um, existing office that had consent to convert it to four two-bed flats and build two new bed houses on the same site. Um, it came up... Uh, I was pretty under the cosh to get an offer out because I got it late and I was like pretty angry at myself for that. I was like, I should be finding these six unit schemes off the bat in my local area. Um, I found it late. Bidding deadline was being pulled. I didn't think I could pull a comprehensive bid. So I decided to step away from that process. And I knew I wouldn't be competitive because I wouldn't really be able to get into the detail. But what I did do was I put a note in my diary in four weeks time to check in with the agent and then assess where we're at from there. So anyway, fully consented scheme. Sold to, obviously, uh, one of the, maybe the highest bidder, I don't know. Um, but there were, I think, 16 bids. Um, they went to second, they went to best and final, so second round bidding. And this party pinched the, pinched the deal. We, um, I checked in with the agent and he said, no, we're in legals. And I put a note in my diary every two weeks to call that agent back. Whether I need to signpost that for, have you got any other deals? We've just had a deal drop through or whatever it may be. And then, yeah. then sort of lean back into... Uh, it's called Sunset Court. What happens to Sunset Court? And then you sort of get... And, and it got to the point where I was calling him so much. He said, Jack, this, this, this guy's... Sh you know, he's going to buy the site. Can you just leave that one alone? Um, at which point I said, uh, no. Yeah, basically. Yeah. I was like, you know, my, my view is, has it completed? No. Well, it hasn't gone then. Um, and after six months of follow-up, I caught the agent at the right time. 
we discussed it in detail and long and short they, they, they were dragging and there wasn't much communication in legals and we I basically said look I'll take the contract at the same value and get the deal done quicker than they will by the sounds of things doesn't even sound like they've started and he said let me check in with my client and see where we're at so he came back and he said all right what are you going to do? And I said, well, I said, we'll take the contracts at the same value, not even knowing what the, the purchase price is. Um, and he said, well, you have to view it first. And I was like, yeah, I probably will do actually. <laughs> so anyway, that, that following week went to view it. Um, obviously no notice that it's a great scheme for us, six units in um, Buckinghamshire, you know, 40 minutes from my house, 40 minutes from ben house, Ben's house, directly between us, um, really affluent area. Um, and I knew that we could probably add a bit of value on that site. Um, there were a few things that we had to really iron out and address and one was the drainage there was quite a comprehensive drainage plan drawn up for the planning application which the council requested that we thought we could push back on how robust it was because it was only six units going in where there's already an existing you know two and a half thousand square foot office building Um, and also there the the houses were one bed houses but they were big enough to be two beds and also the flats um, had um, quite a large uh, loft and we thought we could go into the loft. Second to that, the design of the, the office building was terrible and the core area was completely demolished and rebuilt, which we knew would cost about 70, 80 k. So that's, sort of, you know, straight off margin. So we re- reworked the scheme on our side without telling obviously the sellers yeah. to overcome that cost. So we ended up reworking the scheme, following up the bid. We bought the, we bought the site at the same value um that the existing buyer was going to buy it for um which was 780 grand for the site um we've um gone in for planning and we've actually converted the loft um and we fit like seven v-luxes to utilize that space we convert it from two two bed flats to two uh to sorry four two bed flats to two two beds and two three beds and obviously we're maximizing the the, the size of the houses um and the gdv has gone from like initial stack of 1.8 to 2.6 um, so that enhancement and reworking, some of that comes at a cost of you know construction and delivering that. But our our profit on um, GDV is is you know up to the thirties now on that particular scheme, which had consent. We didn't even agree the price. We we took on someone else's agreed yeah. price. If they're listening um, to this, yeah. <laughs> they're going to be punching the so. computer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we 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 we're going to do really well out of that scheme. And that was a a prime example of you don't have to be bidding on something first time around. It's all in the follow up. And there's, thir- you know, even more so, i tell you who else is punching the screen, the 13 other bidders that should have probably been revisited um, because they were shown interest and, and we didn't even view it by the time that we, we had an offer pretty much agreed subject to a viewing. Um, so it's being persistent, being there at the right time, building a bit of rapport with the agent, proving that you can do it. And that is the power of follow-up. Um, now more to like metrics is, my view is if I've assessed something and offered on something, all the hard work's done, so for me to revisit that deal and come back, pick up the same deal and contact the agent, it's a lot less work than finding something completely new, viewing it, building rapport. So my, my return on time is huge. It's probably 5x. So my view is if I can constantly just revisit my pipeline on all the deals that I've offered on and then obviously look at some new stuff because there might be 80-20 split, but probably 80% of my time is spent on follow-up. Okay. Um, and you're going to have a lot more success. There's actually, it's a national stat, so it's probably not accurate for developers, but um, one in three deals between offer acceptance and exchange fall through Mm -hmm. for one reason or another, whether that's buy or seller or bank or whatever. Um, But I want that 30% on everything that I've offered on, and I want to make sure that I'm the first person to get that 30% on everything that I've offered on. So if it's 10 offers a month, hard offers a month, 40 deals review, you know, that's three or four sites a month that, I need to be revisiting and making sure I'm on that. So it's been a huge stat for us. And 90% of the deals we've bought, we didn't secure first time round. So if I had zero follow-up progress, um, I would be buying 10% of what I have bought. So, you know, what is that? If I'm doing a deal every four weeks, that's a deal every 40 weeks. It's just, yeah, not even transferable. So building a follow-up process and don't rely on, on, don't rely on your memory. Don't rely on anything like that in sales. You need to put, everything onto tech and make notes on a system and check in and set yourself reminders and the better those reminders are the warmer the conversation is next time so we have a really regimented follow-up process in following up all the deals we offered on and that's probably been more so successful than our original offer process anyway yeah I, I love that I think that's so good in that case study because at that point where 
the deal's fallen through, or in that example, it's it's the transaction wasn't really moving forward and yeah. you stepped in. I mean, the agent just wants their commission. They yeah. don't want to have mm -hmm. to put it back on the market, speak to all these different buyers, go and do more viewings, drive 30 minutes mm -hmm. out of the office to show people around. The seller's more motivated than ever, so they probably even consider taking mm -hmm. a lower price if you can um, move quicker. And so it's just, the, and, and you've already done the work. Mm -hmm. You've already yeah, yeah. spent how many hours in the spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. So it's it comes back to one of the yeah. first points you made in this conversation is you can't just expect these deals to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've got to force them. So yeah, I love it. So obviously you're very like process, organization driven. Similar to you, right? Yeah, so similar to me. <laughs> I'm not very good at organisation. Um, you have multiple businesses. Yeah. Talk us through what each of them are, because that's got to be massively important when running. We we have two, but you've got five. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have. Um, yeah, we have five businesses in the ecosystem. Um, do, you, do you, just sorry to interrupt, but do you see them as five different businesses, or do you see it as one business with five different parts? Yeah. Um, it's definitely five different businesses. Okay. Um, I think that's normally driven from decision making, um, from a social perspective, all of our business, you know, our Christmas party is 27 people. Yeah. Um, and from a social side, we're, we're one little unit and everyone, you know, everyone loves the surveyors that don't like talking to anyone because they're surveyors <laughs> and, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the estate manager that's more mumsy and, you yeah. know, that it, it, it from a social perspective, we're all one unit, but day to day, we, they, do, they all do completely different things. And, and actually, they Ben and I are big believers, and, and he has actually probably installed more of this in me than I have installed in him, that a business should be able to run itself without you in it. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need management, you need people knowing what they're doing, and you also you should be doing strategy stuff, working on it rather than in it. Mm -hmm. um, and... I do think our businesses are, are quite different in ways. We we do, we work on the same schemes and we we do a lot of the same things. But there's equally or there's probably more business outside of internal business that we actually work on. So more of our business comes from externally than it does internally within our businesses. The benefit of the internal um, sort of like cohesion is is really easy to set them up because there is no risk because. We are doing, so I'll go through the businesses and, and how XP Survey started is a, is a good example. Um, but the original businesses was I run a management and HMO business with my brother, which is called Central Suites. So it's coming up to five years old. Um, XP Property, which I founded with Ben. So we're two directors in that business, uh, which is also in excess of four years. I think it's coming up to five as well. Um, so that's the main development business, which is XP Property. When I met Ben, he had already set up Aura Architecture, his architectural practice. And then Ben and I hated the service we were getting for measurement building surveys and topographical surveys, so we set up XP surveys. Um, so that's four. Uh, we also then, uh, XP Property, are um, a shareholder in a social portfolio with, with the delivery team for us. So that's the five. Um, ben had done property before that, and I had, and mine was in a company, so I wouldn't have necessarily said it was a business, but it's uh, maybe there's more, more to that. Um, so technically speaking, now we're, you know, five, six years on since the original one set up. You can look back and say, if we get a site, we can survey it, we can design it, we can deliver it, and we can manage it, whether that management's private, which is HMOs and co-living, or whether it's social, which is a slightly different tenant type. So we can pretty much do any project end-to-end -to, -end to some degree, and we can, um, a lot of the project actually goes all the way through the sausage machine, and rather than us having to go to a third party, it's all controlled in-house. Everyone knows each other. So if it's a specific surveyor going to the site and we need loft dimensions or an elevation that's really important or a neighbor, neighboring you know, building height that's really important, we can make sure that's installed at the beginning. The design team are obviously, or architecture, most of their work is external, but it's great having that, that sort of string to our bow to be able to really easily mobilize design internally and pull off their skills and expertise and their contacts. Um, and Ben, you know, as discussed, the building behind us, he was technical manager at the Berkeley Group. He was never an architect. He was technical manager. So he's really good at managing that business as a business owner, but he's not designing stuff in there. So he does help with that in XP Property. Um, then there's obviously XP Property. We wanted to be, um, you know, an enterprising and dy dynamic SME property development business in the home counties in West London. Um, delivering eight schemes a year 
Uh, we're now delivering £16 million worth of stock. We've bought 59 sites. And it's very much we buy something, create value, whether that's mixed-use commercial residential land, uh, re-gearing leases, structuring something financially. It doesn't really matter. We are developers. We develop stuff. It doesn't have to be a specific type. Um, and that is probably where Ben and I spend most of our time. It probably is the most time intensive, but I don't know if you guys find this, but a property development business is like no other business. Yeah. <laughs> it's not because it's not like a product or a service almost. It's an entirely different beast. Yeah. I mean, you, you can, you can build a team or you could not, you can get seed capital on one project, but not another and diversify that. Um, it's, it's just, it's very, there's, there, there isn't really any other businesses out there like a property development company. So, um, that was, I think XP property was always mine and Ben's childhood dreams and aspirations and goals. So that was sort of the core of Ben and I coming together. Um, and the others were sort of spin offs of hating the process or being annoyed at something or see an opportunity. And then Central Suites, which I run with my brother, is much more family oriented. Like I enjoy working alongside my brother day to day. We work in the same office. Um, all of our team are based out of the same office. So there's a really good group amongst us we've obviously got ben's uh clapham office and then our office, head office in in henley um and we're now up to about 100 beds under management most of them own some of them xp property stock so when we finish something we benefit from the management fee as well but also we, we're invested because i've developed it and, and now we're also managing it um so they're the four companies and then the social portfolio um basically came about because a uh a school friend of mine who's doing really well in a prop tech, I suppose you could say, business, um, approached me with an opportunity with a um, basically a signed mandate from a housing association. Um, he wanted to work on the acquisition side, which was really difficult for me to give up, I must admit. Um, scratching my head like, why is he paying guide for stuff? Yeah. <laughs> um, but he worked on driving the deals forward. Um, we got pulled in as the delivery team, so we're pro like basically project managing all the, all the schemes. Uh, the mandate was for um, basically 200 beds a year until anything changes in Croydon. Mm -hmm. And the other business partner in that is uh, a guy called Thomas, who runs all of the legal um, conveyancing, finance accounts, etc. And then the fourth and final partner is a funding partner who we brought in, who we work with quite a lot on equity stuff from developments. Mm -hmm. um, Ex-hedge fund moved into property funding. We met them five, six years ago, get on really well with them. Um, and we brought them in as the equity funding partner. Um, so that, yeah, in the last 18 months, we've delivered 100 beds. We've got another 30 or so to go. Uh, we've agreed an exit on that, on a compressed yield. So it's buying tired care, care homes, HMOs, um, putting the housing association in there on a 10 to 25 year lease, and then selling the income um, on that portfolio. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So it's not, a, you're not finding these units to sell to the... HA or whoever has the mandate, you're and you're finding them, putting them in on the lease, and then selling it to like the investment market exactly on the compressed that, deal. Yeah. <laughs> I, want to, I want to touch on the the finance side of things. Obviously, a wizard at finding deals. Obviously, all these deals have to be funded one way or another, and um, maybe you don't have an unlimited pot of cash yourself, as most developers don't. And obviously, we have to then bring in <laughs> banks, investors, etc. I'd just be keen to know, and obviously you know, kind of the three pillars of development, if you like, is obviously the deal flow, the capital, and then the project management side of things. <clears throat> deal, the deal side of things we talked about, I guess Ben is more on the delivery side yeah. of things. The capital raising and the managing the finance side of things, is that your responsibility? Um, yeah, so it, so I, I arrange all debt, development, and bridging finance. Um, that's my job. Um, so I do, yeah, finding, structuring, and funding. Um, with that funding... It's technically my job to find the equity, yeah. um, but we have found that equity can't be found necessarily uh, always the way that you want it. Um, mm -hmm. It comes from all interesting places, uh, interesting times, normally the wrong time, um, and is, is pretty difficult. And, you know, we really struggled for, with our first deal. We, you know, we, we were courting eight to ten developers, uh, eight to ten partners um 
I actually think what let us down is we didn't have confidence in ourselves. Eight, okay. So the eight to ten partners in one deal? No, we had we 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 had sort of to some degree like wined and dined. I like met with coffee, met with lunch, did half a dozen meetings with six to ten investors on our first deal, and no no one really wanted to do the deal with us, and it was really difficult because I was like, what are we doing wrong here? Like I'm, we're pretty investable. Ben's background's pretty good. I you know I know how to build stuff. We've got contacts that can help us. It's not that a complicated deal. What is going wrong? And you learn that there's emotion involved in in retail investment, which is where we started. Mm-hmm. Um, but fundamentally, one so one thing we've always been is 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 really just upfront and honest because we've learned that by looking at others, um, we we're fortunate not to get into a predic- predicament ourselves. But by not by pulling wool over people's eyes or not being transparent that things do go wrong, things happen, is how you deal with them, is, is, yeah. is how, you know, you want to partner with someone. Um, and you, you sort of want to outline all the potential qualms, at the, you know, at the beginning, and that's always what we've done. Um, so that part we were doing right. I just don't know if we had much confidence in ourselves. Um, but we always have a rule in our business, finding um, equity is we communicate what we do, um, whether it's the right time, right person, or a new time and different person, we're very relaxed. Um, we have now got more funding than deals, which has not never been the case before. Um, and that has come from, we, we really enjoy Ben meeting with them independently, me meeting with them independently, getting to know them, getting to know what works for them, um, understanding their sort of way of dealing with things. Um, we do, it may sound really, op- you know, open and open-minded we, we also have some pretty finite rules that we run off that we've learned like if we have a conversation with a potential investor and more than 50 percent of the things that they say are negative we won't work with them because if it's negative now it's going to be really negative negative in, in, in what sense about the Any deal or just in general if they're just complaining about the weather no no do you commercially yeah. negative um like oh but it doesn't have parking Oh, but it, you know, yeah. but if they're picking up on more of the uh, negative things and the optimistic things, it's going to be a long journey. Um, so we do have more sort of underlying rules like that, um, purely because we want to be working with people that want to work with us and not cause us, you know, trouble. We are good at delivering developments. Things do go wrong, mm-hmm. and what we always do with all of our schemes, if anything goes wrong, is we weigh up options, even if we know one of the options is the best. We'll put it to the investor and say, these are our three options. This is the one we would go for. What do you think? And they love that more so than something going wrong and then sort of ramming that down your throat. Um, but to answer your question, who does the equity raising or investment raising, or like both of us or all of us, I think that um, everyone in your team should be investable. Um, everyone in your team should understand what we do. Like I said, tra- if you cannot, if, if you can't tell someone what you do really eloquently and short and sharp, how are they going to remember that? Um, and I think that's helped us from learning because um, if there's just too much blah, blah, they sort of get lost and forget and struggle to understand. But um, all of us in the team, I suppose me and Ben are always the ones that, 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 that finally bring the sort of last few steps over the line and, and make sure that those people have all their questions answered. And we're always, we have investors. that So that funding partner that we brought into the social I could walk into his office and ask him for the capital for a deal and he wouldn't even want to see the deal. He just trust you? Yeah, and he wouldn't want any engagement in monthly. Like he'd, he'd rather talk about you know, F1 than, than the actual deal that he's invested in the progress on it. So you have those people and that's their way of dealing things and realistically, legally, he's probably covered, but you then have other people who need a weekly check-in, which we always accommodate. We always make sure that whatever someone needs, we'll, we'll do that for them. Um, so it is a very collaborative thing in our business and we sometimes find that some people's personalities gel better with others so that we then just allocate that Ben as a port of contact or me, me as a port of contact. Um, so collectively, really. I just want to and diving into, so you mentioned we you discussing a deal with an investor, you kind of give them multiple options. Yeah. I just want to understand more about how you structure the stack. So I, th- I guess these investors... Banks, development finance is going to be the majority of the stack. Yeah. These investors that are coming for kind of the equity piece without shortfall, what are the options, what are some examples of the options? Could it just be straight interest rate as debt? Could it be equity with profit share? Um, how do you kind of structure that piece? Yeah, so first off, we don't really like too much borrowing debt 
on first charge because from private investors from private investors because private investors run out of money and banks don't really so so we think that that's a an irrelevant replacement i think you're just just utilizing maybe a get out of jail card for something that you, you could have had anyway for a bank maybe a bit of more of an arduous process having said that we have done first charge debt with investors before when banks have messed us around but anyway so we um, predominantly work on um, securities after first charge on either equity or loan investments um, we prefer to work with one party um, unless it's via crowdfunding which we have crowdfunded you know our second deal i think we crowdfunded um and the way that we position it is sorry that's still debt that you've crowdfunded um in that scenario it's debt yeah um the way that we do it is we build an investment um, prospectus um which is a very short sharp um content heavy to some degree in terms of there's not much there but what is there is the, the high level stuff um deck we send that out it's normally two or three pages which is um location summary of deal uh investment required and then we always put on there equity or loan investment mm -hmm. and then the duration so the amount is the same whether it's equity or, or, or a loan whether that's second charge loan or, or other um and then we let the conversation go when we're face to face or on a call with them because they might be either or um sometimes uh, we, like I said, we've got four in delivery. We currently own six sites. We've got four that we've exchanged. So soon to be, we'll own six to eight sites. And that's pretty much our average. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't want all equity and we wouldn't want all loan because if we're good at what we do, we make more margin on our loan investments because we're arbitraging the loan yeah. ticket against the IRR of the development. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're bad at what we do, the loan investment balance and balances the portfolio. So we try and get a bit of a 50-50 blend across the portfolio so let's say by coincidence, we put six investment prospectus out over a three-month period. All of them came back as equity. We'd probably push back on a couple um, and see if we could find someone else to plug that gap for our business sake. Um, but we'd probably never be too upset about doing all equity deals because it's great to work with other people. Um, if, we see, if we do what we say we're going to do, everyone benefits. And we are always thinking about you know, a year, more than a year ahead because we're not trying to screw anyone on investment from the from the outset. Um, so we'd rather do equity deals, but we wouldn't want a whole book of loan deals. I think that's extremely risky. Um, and even, you know, up to up to like majority, I think that's also really risky. Um, and unfortunately, we've seen some development companies fall foul of that um, because it does become a borrowing process and they borrow to pay and so on and so forth. So we just want balance um, and we can control what we can control um, and we can do the best that we can. Um, and sometimes that's having high level strategy reviews like that. So we send the investment deck out is not that detailed from a numbers perspective because it's our investment pr prospectus is to start a conversation, not to give someone a yes or no. Um, so if they like location, deal size, investment size, we get on a chat. Love it. Okay. So what's looking two, five, ten years ahead, what's what's the goals, what's the plan? Um, More businesses or? Yeah, we've actually been told off for setting up businesses by <laughs> wives and <laughs> business yeah, managers. Yeah. Um, I think Ben and I would would open more businesses in different areas and, you know, look at m and and stuff like that. Like my, my passion is business. Mm -hmm. His is probably more property, but he's really good at, at business. He's, he's, he's extremely well versed in you know, business application, I think there's a lot of value in that. He's grown all architecture from, you know, I think they're due to turn over seven figures in their fifth year, which is crazy from a standstill. Um, but f looking forward, so to break the businesses down, because we like to do that, they're not all on one bank account, they're not all the same yeah. team, they're not all the same payroll. Um, so starting with, uh, I'll start chronologically as developments go on. So XP Surveys, two years old, um, six in the team, we do want to grow that business a lot more. Um, I think we turned over 130k in our first year, 280k in our second year, um, made a profit in both years. We're looking to basically uh, grow 100% in the next two years, and that will include doubling our surveying um, in-house capability. Um, that's just really fun because running a development company is really difficult, especially from a cash flow perspective. Um, but we get 
you know, 50% of our invoices are paid before we lift the, leave the office. Yeah. It's a service-based business, so as soon as we've done it, we're fully paid up. Mm -hmm. um, and it's crazy seeing, like, I think it was like month three, our balance was greater on revenue than it was in costs. And I was like, there must be something going wrong here. We've got <laughs> payments coming out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, grow that and scale that. We've got some creative ideas. You know, I, I make it the office laugh when I say that we're the we're the Elon Musk coming to the car motive industry. Mm -hmm. In the surveying market, we've got an automated quotation tool that, that no one else has for both topographical and measured building surveys. Mm -hmm. um, we've got an um, international team that can that can develop the plotting work overnight. So we don't just do everything in-house. We can outsource it and get that turnaround quicker. Um, we've got kit that the, the minority of the market are using, which is quicker, more efficient, can do 3D models, um, so on and so forth. So we're constantly trying to improve everything in that business to make it, um, I suppose, more tech-driven and advanced than any other business out there. And that's XP Surveys. Um, then on to Aura Architecture, um, maybe Ben might come and speak on this podcast one day, so I'll let him tell you the future on the architectural business. But I don't think his team's going to grow hugely, but I think they're going to work on slightly larger value schemes. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing, you know, 50 to 60 schemes a year, so they're quite a busy company. Um, I think there's 13 or 14 people internally. Um, and Ben's aim was actually to scale that and sort of pull himself outside the business to focus on development. So he's got an operations manager in that managing that business. On to XP Property, um, we don't really want to do more deals. Um, so the six to eight annualize we like. So that is starting and exit exiting six to eight. Obviously, they overlap year to year. Um, we're not like the housing land supply where they count half finished projects and finished projects. Yeah. Um, we if it's if it falls in that year, it falls in that year. So we focus on three in legal, three in delivery, and three in sales. That's our six to eight a year. Um, our average GDV at the moment is about two to three million across those six to eight. Um, we want to be progressively and surmountably increasing that every year um, to get to a 50 million pipeline. Um, so that will look at, you know, seven to 10 mil GDV schemes. We want to stay below house builders. Um, and we actually believe our current team, um, which is six of us, is the same team that could be delivering that. Um, we don't necessarily want to run a construction company because yeah. um, we want the construction companies to take the risk on that. If we're taking the investment risk, design risk, acquisition risk, and everything else, we want that to sit on someone else. Um, so we would just like to keep on delivering schemes in the home counties, West London, North London. Um, so yeah, six to eight sites. There probably might be some planning plays in there that we sell on without, with, with, without actually having to deliver it and, and getting planning. Um, but 50 million is our target annualized um, revenue point. We're currently at 16, so we've got a bit of growth to be doing, but I foresee that probably we'd be aiming to do that within the next five years. Um, and then central suites, that will naturally grow as XP property grows because we manage everything we keep, which is about 50%. Um, we, it, central suites is, a, is an interesting one because given the right circumstances, the right team, I'd love for that to be a franchise type model of co-living businesses around the home counties. And what I mean by that is if you were to go on, um, won't say any names, someone's course mm -hmm. to do a HMO module, the first two things I'll say is make sure there's a university and make sure there's a train station. All of our portfolio are in towns that don't have a university and one of them has a train station, the others don't. Yeah. And we've won HMO awards. We've, we've yeah. got all money out deals. We've, Bought a house in Henley on Thames, which is in the top ten most richest, well, richest and wealthiest areas in the UK, on a thirteen percent yield. Um, so proving that HMOs do work in affluent areas, and we're breaking that mould. And you don't need a university, and you don't need a trade station, so to speak. It helps, but you don't necessarily need it. So we are basically building a cookie cutter um, brand, um, product, um, systems, team, finance package. And we're basically hoping to reach capacity in all the areas that we're dealing in, which is towns and, and smaller cities that have circa 15,000 population and just replicate that in all the other little areas. We have really um, low barrier for entry because no one else wants to go there because there's no universities or train stations. But we love it because capital appreciation is phenomenal. There's no other competition. We will monopolize those areas we have done in two areas. And the aim is for that business um, to just basically pull rather than go to 
um, you know, Manchester and have a thousand beds, have a thousand beds across 10 different towns and really own that town and really be the central, you know, the person to go to for that. So specialize in that. Um, we're op operating in three towns at the moment. So we want to be more than that, like 10. And we'll have a core team and then, and then a regional team. The regional team will have the exact same employment structure. So the exact same amount of people doing exact same, you know, maintenance, estate management, and then the core team is your management, finance, FD, um, and all of us. And then you have an acquisitions team that helps um, sort of train up. So we're, we're looking at that. It's getting there. And then obviously we're managing all of our other stock. Um, so eventually we want to get to, yeah, um, four, four figure beds, but we'll get there hopefully. There's so much to be said about how much clarity you have over those goals and you, you know exactly what what it is you want to achieve when you want to achieve it by because we rosie and i, I mean we, we speak to a lot of people all the time every week that are in development what want to get in development maybe need some help when it comes to understanding how to raise finance find deals etc etc and one of the questions we was asking you know what's the goal and they just they don't know they don't know they haven't got an answer and well they'll be like to be a developer well, like something really well, just broad brush. Well, even there, just you know, just relating to the business. But you know, I, I think one of the, the biggest keys to, to productivity and growth is just actually having the clarity around, um, you know, what you want to achieve. I mean, we went and saw Grant Cardone, and he, I heard him say recently, like knowing what you want and when you want it is a superpower yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm impressed that just across all the business, then you could reel off like such clarity exactly what it is you want uh, to achieve with each one. But yeah, I mean. We'll wrap up the conversation there. It's been insightful. Definitely so how well. almost militant you are with just your processes. Sure. Um, it's impressive. So, yeah, thank thanks you. for coming. Uh, thank you for having me on.